This is the second lecture of chapter 17, which deals with aldehydes and ketones. So in this lecture, we will do a quick review of the aldehyde and ketone functional group. And we'll also review the nomenclature of these functional groups, or molecules that have these functional groups. Then in today's lecture, we will concentrate on the oxidation of aldehydes. As of course, as you will recall, oxidation is a special type reaction of chemistry, especially organic chemistry. Then next, we will look at the reduction of aldehydes and ketones. Again, reduction is another type of reactions that are important in organic chemistry. Then we'll look at the addition of alcohols to aldehydes and ketones. You will recall that addition is another, a third type of reactions that we covered throughout our course in organic chemistry. Typically, the addition of a molecule or two atoms across a, typically, a double bond. So we'll have examples of that in this lecture. And to conclude, we will look at the applications of making, of using this reaction in terms of adding alcohols and to aldehydes and ketones. So we'll look at a special type reaction where this is applicable. So let's begin. As a review, let's look again at aldehydes and ketones. So the nomenclature and the structure. Remember that the aldehyde has the carbon-oxygen double bond, as shown right here. But the aldehyde has a hydrogen. And back here, it's a carbon-containing alkyl group. So that's the aldehyde. To name an aldehyde, the alkane, the E of the alkane, goes to Al, so the name becomes alkanal for the alkane. Once you have identified the number of carbons in that alkane, then that's used to determine the name. For example, here we have six carbons, and you will recall that six carbons correspond to hexane. So the name goes from hexane to hexanel. Notice here we need not put one, but if you did, it's not incorrect because one is, of course, the location of the aldehyde functional group. The same goes here. Five carbons in this aldehyde. That corresponds to pentane, the Pentane goes to pentanal, and this becomes the IUPAC name of this molecule here. Ketones. We'll have to identify the ketone functionality, and here it is. It's different from aldehyde because it's bonded to an alkyl group back here, a carbon-containing alkyl group in this case a methyl, and another carbon-containing alkyl group. So that makes it different from your aldehyde. So identify this, then start numbering from the end closest to your carbon-oxygen double bond. So we go one, two, three, four, five, six. Six carbons corresponds to Hexane, so we change the name of the E 
to O N E, so it becomes an alkanone. So this has six carbons, so it becomes a hexanone. Again, a main difference between naming an, a ketone and an aldehyde is that we'll have to indicate the position of the carbon-oxygen double bond by a number. And here it is. So the name of this molecule is 2 hexanone. This molecule is an isomer, a different molecule from this one. Here the carbonyl is in a different location. Notice we start numbering from this end because this end is closest to the carbonyl. So this again is a hexanone but it's a 3-hexanone because the carbonyl functionality here is in location number 3. So that's a review for you. Let's go into today's lecture. So, the first reaction that we look at is an oxidation. So let's refresh our memory in terms of the definition. One definition of oxidation is the supply of oxygen and the removal of hydrogen. This part here will be very important for us in organic chemistry, which is the removal of hydrogen to produce molecules of different functional groups. As a review, you may recall that if we had a primary alcohol, notice again, a primary alcohol, the carbon of the alcohol is bonded to one alkyl containing group, but it has two hydrogens here. If there is an oxidation using an oxidizing agent, one of these hydrogens will be removed. And if one is removed, we have here a new functional group that's called an aldehyde. So again, to relate this concept here to the definition, it's the removal of a hydrogen. That's an oxidation. Removal of a hydrogen is an oxidation. Notice here we have an aldehyde. And we are looking at a discussion here for aldehydes. So here an aldehyde has a hydrogen that's bonded to the carbon of the carbonyl. So if this hydrogen is removed, that's an oxidation. So with the appropriate oxidizing agent, which we'll discuss, if this hydrogen is removed, and here it's gone, and we have inserted here another oxygen, notice again, supply of oxygen, we have an oxidation here. So for this process, it involves the aldehyde in the presence of an oxidizing agent to produce a carboxylic acid. That's a different functionality. So the process involves an aldehyde in the presence of an oxidizing agent will give carboxylic acids. Let us look at some examples of oxidizing agents. One that's typically used is potassium dichromate in sulfuric acid. As you can see, that's a good oxidizing agent. Here's the formula. It's because it has lots of oxygens, so it can deliver oxygens because oxidizing agents supply oxygens. So this is a good oxidizing agent. Here's your organic reactant, hexanal. Notice the A for the aldehyde. It has a hydrogen bonded to the carbonyl carbon. So in the process 
of an oxidation, we will get a carboxylic acid in that this hydrogen is removed and an OH is inserted. So we have here a new functional group which is a carboxylic acid and you may remember the name of this molecule is hexanoic acid or the name of that functional group is a carboxylic acid. Here's another example. In this case, however, the oxidizing agent is just molecular oxygen. Molecular oxygen is a good oxidizing agent. And we know that because if you have iron sitting outside, over time it will rust. And rust is just basically the oxidation of iron. So if we have benzaldehyde, which is an aldehyde, here's a carbonyl, here's an oxygen, here's an hydrogen, pardon me. In the presence of oxygen, there is an oxidation and the oxidation will involve the removal of this hydrogen, because that's the, one of the definitions, and the insertion of OH or an oxygen. So we'll have benzoic acid, which is a carboxylic acid. So you should be able to predict the product of the oxidation of aldehydes to give a new functional group or a different functional group known as a carboxylic acid. Here's a practical application of oxidation. And this is known as the Tollens test. So there's a specific reagent that's called the Tollens reagent. And here it is. It's a silver reagent silver ions. It will serve as an oxidizing agent to remove this hydrogen to produce the carbox carboxylic acid. Since it's in a base, it's the carboxylate salt. But of importance, the silver salt goes to silver metal. And of course, as you know, for a mirror, it's basically silver metal that's behind the mirror, giving it that reflective property. So, if this reaction is done properly, it will oxidize the Tollens reagent, that is, will oxidize an aldehyde to a, carbox, to a carboxylate anion, and in the process, produces silver, as shown here, on the surface of the container. So if you go in the lab and you have an unknown compound and you mix it with Tollens reagent, if you get a silver deposit on the container, more than likely that unknown is an aldehyde. This is known as a Tollens test for aldehydes. So that's a practical example that's used in the lab to determine if an unknown compound is an aldehyde or not. Let us turn our attention now to ketones. As you can see here is the general feature of a ketone. Here's a carbonyl carb group. It's bonded to an R group, carbon-containing R group, and to another carbon-containing R group. Notice no hydrogens. Bonded. So therefore, it's not surprising that in the presence of an oxidizing agent, there's no reaction because there is no hydrogen bonded to this carbon that can be removed. So therefore, if you take 2-pentanone, which is a ketone, here is a carbon-containing alkyl group, one carbon, so it's a methyl group, 
Here's another carbon-containing alkyl group. If you mix this with sodium dichromate, a strong oxidizing agent, you can tell because there are lots of oxygen, or even with molecular oxygen, there is no reaction. Why? Because we have defined oxidation as the removal of hydrogen from this carbon here. So since there is none that's bonded, there is no reaction shown here. So ketones cannot be reacted any further with an oxidizing agent. Okay, let's turn our attention now to another type reaction known as reduction. So using the same approach, let us define reduction. Make sure we understand the concept of reduction. And then we apply that concept to solving problems. Reduction is the opposite of oxidation. So whatever we learned for oxidation, just think in reverse. So therefore, it's the removal of oxygen and the supply of hydrogen, it's the exact opposite. Of importance for us in organic chemistry is the supply of hydrogen. The supply of hydrogen. In organic chemistry, hydrogen is typically supplied as H minus. We call that the hydride ion. So once again, hydrogen as a reducing agent is H minus. Notice here it's H with a pair of electrons and a formal charge of negative one as shown here. So applying that to a reaction, here is our carbonyl for the aldehyde or ketone. You will recall that this is a polar covalent bond which makes this partially positive and this oxygen here partially negative. So if this hydride ion is negative as we can see here, it will react with this carbon as shown here to form a new bond right here. These electrons will swing out to have a negative charge here, so that's a salt and called an alkoxide ion. In a second step in an acid, we get this as the product. Notice this is an alcohol because it's a carbon that's bonded to here and OH. But here's the hydrogen that's added from the reducing agent. So note again, this is a two-step reaction in which the hydride or the reducing agent adds first to the carbon of the carbonyl and in a second step, a acid is used to form the alcohol. So let's look at specific reagents. The specific reagent here that we'll concentrate on for this course is sodium borohydride. This is the reagent that will supply H minus. So you cannot go to the lab uh, and buy a mole of H minus because as you can see that's an anion. It's, 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 it's not neutral, it's not a molecule. The molecule that supplies H minus is sodium borohydride as shown in this name. So you go to the lab, the stock room, and you buy a mole or a gram of sodium borohydride, which is a strong reducing agent because it supplies H minus, which is needed for reduction. So again, as we can see here in the summary, the H minus supplies that H, that hydrogen. It's a good reducing agent. 
So let's look at some reactions in which we use sodium borohydride. So here is cyclohexanone. So this is a ketone. And we know that because here's a carbonyl and it's bonded to a carbon group and another carbon group here. This is sodium borohydride which supplies H minus. We know this bond is a polar covalent bond carbon being partially positive and the oxygen being partially negative. So this H will bond right here to that carbon as shown here and we'll have a salt, an alkoxide anion and in the presence of H plus, notice H plus and negative, we will get a bond right here and this is an alcohol. One thing I should point out here though is that this alcohol here, let me point out this alcohol right here, is a secondary alcohol. Why? Because this carbon of the alcohol is bonded to a carbon and another carbon, two carbons or two carbon groups. So it's a secondary alcohol. So, a summary. Ketones are reduced by sodium borohydride after hydrolysis with an acid to produce a secondary alcohol. Let's look at the reduction of an aldehyde. Here's an aldehyde because of this H. Here is sodium borohydride as we have here, so it will supply H minus, bonded right here, and of course this H2O will do the same as it did here to add H to the O. So when this reaction is done, what we'll have here is H that's added to this carbon, 1H will be added to this carbon. It already has an H, so it now has two H's that's bonded to this carbon that has the OH. So you'll see this is a primary alcohol. So, summary. Aldehydes, let's write it here, are reduced to primary alcohols. Why? Because of this H. And we maintain that H in the product and it adds another H from the reducing agent. Let's look at a couple more reactions. So here we have butanal. Notice the A, which indicates the presence of a aldehyde functionality. If this aldehyde reacts with sodium borohydride, remember the H minus here comes from the sodium borohydride, the reducing agent, and here it is, right here, and of course this H adds to the oxygen, so here we have an alcohol, notice this is an O for the alcohol, equally important, this is a primary alcohol. So aldehydes are reduced to primary alcohols. Ketones, here's a ketone. Why is it a ketone? Because here is a methyl group, carbon containing, and here is another carbon containing group. No hydrogens bonded to this carbon. The reaction with sodium borohydride, which generates H minus, will react here, and here it is. And in the second step, a hydrogen will be added to the oxygen. 
So we'll have an alcohol. Since this alcohol here has a carbon that's bonded to one alkyl group and another alkyl group, it is a secondary alcohol. Of course, the name of this alcohol is 2-pentanol. Notice the O. Pentanol makes it an alcohol. So again, you should be able to predict the product of the reaction of an aldehyde with sodium borohydride followed by hydrolysis. You should be able to predict the product or the structure of that alcohol. If you have a ketone, you should be able to predict the structure of the alcohol, in this case a secondary alcohol, after the reaction with a good reducing agent. Let us look at another reducing agent, and this is used a lot, especially in industry. And this is actually the use of molecular hydrogen. Here it is, H2, because that's readily available and it's cheap, but it's not very reactive, so we have to use a catalyst. The catalyst that's typically used is a transition metal catalyst. Those elements that are found in the middle of the periodic table. The one that's used a lot in industry is typically palladium or platinum. So if we have a aldehyde, in this case pentanol, aldehyde because of that H, in the presence of H2 and, I don't know, PT, for example, we will get here pentanol. Notice this is a secondary alcohol, I mean a primary alcohol here. Because we will add here hydrogen right across this and here. So in other words, molecular hydrogen will add right here and here and here it is and of course this hydrogen is coming from that hydrogen so that makes this molecule here a primary alcohol let's look at a ketone here is cyclopentanone in the presence of hydrogen and a transition metal catalyst Let's put PD here, just for variation. So again, if we have molecular hydrogen, here is the hydrogen. This hydrogen will add here, and this hydrogen will add here. So what we have is this hydrogen from the catalyst, and this hydrogen from the catalyst. So again, this is known as a secondary alcohol. Why? Because here's the carbon of the alcohol functionality, and it's bonded to one and two alkyl groups. That's a secondary alcohol. So again, you can see here you have some flexibility in terms of the, your choice of producing agent. You can use sodium borohydride followed by hydrolysis or you can use molecular hydrogen in the presence of a catalyst to produce your product. Let us turn our attention now to the addition of alcohols to aldehydes and ketones. So this is an addition reaction. Notice these are different now from oxidation and reduction. It's just adding a molecule to another molecule. Some key terms here. The addition of alcohols to aldehydes or ketones forms a new type functional group called a hemiacetal. So that name is a new term for us, a hemiacetal. Hemi here, as you can imagine, means half. 
So we'll see later on it's half of an acetal because we'll define an acetal later on. So let's look at the reaction. Here's an alcohol, in this case an ethanol, CH3, CH2OH for the alcohol. Here is a carbonyl or an aldehyde, C, double bond O, and that H for the aldehyde. Here's a carbon containing group back here. Again, you will recall that this is a polar covalent bond which makes this carbon partially positive and this oxygen partially negative. Why? Because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. Let's look at the alcohol. Here's oxygen bonded to hydrogen. So this bond here is a polar covalent bond and we know that for alcohols. So this hydrogen here is partially positive and this oxygen being more electronegative is partially negative. Of course you can predict what's going to happen here is that this hydrogen will bond to this oxygen and this oxygen will bond to that carbon as shown here. This type molecule is called a hemiacetal. So a hemiacetal has a carbon that's bonded to an OR group, notice the OR, and a hydrogen. So as summarized here, a OR group is bonded to the carbon and a hydrogen is bonded to the oxygen. So this molecule is called a hemiacetal. This reaction occurs readily for aldehydes and ketones in uh, alcohol. You will see here it's a reversible equilibrium. We'll discuss more about that in a second, but this type reaction will occur um, in the presence of an acid, as we'll see later on. Let's look at some more examples here. So here is propanal, that's an aldehyde because of that A and because of the H in the structure. We know this carbon is positive, this oxygen is, is partially negative. Here's methanol, the other reactant. This oxygen is negative and this hydrogen here is positive. So when the reaction occurs to give the hemiacetal, let's see what happens. So this is partially positive, and this is partially negative. This is partially negative and partially positive. So this oxygen will bond here. Here it is. And this hydrogen will bond here, and here it is. So this is our hemiacetal of propanal, which is the aldehyde. Becomes a little trickier whenever it's written like this. And this is the format that you will see on your quiz or, and you, or on your exam, where we just have here the cyclohexanone, for example, recognize it to be a ketone and the alcohol is here written as this. So it's just written a little differently from shown above. But you should recognize that this oxygen will bond to this carbon and this hydrogen will bond to this oxygen. And here is the hemiacetal of cyclohexanone. So you should be able to write the structure. It requires a lot of observation here, looking at the molecules, looking at the reactants, and determine what bonds are made. So again, the easiest way of looking at this is to identify the functional groups and a reaction will take 
place at the functional groups. The reactions that will the reaction that will take place is typically dictated by the partial charges as shown here. So if you can determine this is partially positive and this is partially negative, this partially negative will react with the partially positive hydrogen and this partially positive carbon will react with the partially electronegative oxygen forming bonds as shown here. So again, you should be able to predict the product if given two reactants. A carbonyl compound, a alcohol, an aldehyde or a ketone reacting with any alcohol to give a product. Let us look at a slight variation to this molecule. In this case we have a molecule, one molecule that has two functional groups. In this case it has an aldehyde, here's an aldehyde, and it has a alcohol, here's the alcohol. So we have two functionalities on the same molecule. It, both functionalities can react as described before. It so happens that we'll have an intramolecular reaction. Remember, intra here means within. So it's within the same molecule. So again, do the same analysis. Let's rewrite this. So we bring the functional groups closer to each other. So again, here's a partial negative for the oxygen. Here's the partial positive for the hydrogen. That's one functional group. That's the alcohol. And let's look at the ketone. In this case, the aldehyde, the carbonyl. So this is partially positive and this is partially negative and it's an aldehyde that's shown here. So let's write this out. So we can predict the reaction. This will bond here and this will bond here as shown here and here. So this is now called a cyclic hemiacetal. Cyclic. Notice the structure. It's a ring. Why a ring? Because we have two functional groups that are reacting in the same molecule. Let's look at a practical example of a cyclic hemiacetal. We're familiar with glucose. It's a monosaccharide. It's a sugar. And here's the structure. It has an aldehyde and it has a bunch of alcohols. has a bunch of alcohols, but important it has here an aldehyde, carbonyl, a hydrogen, and a carbon containing group. In nature, six-membered rings are very common. So if we react this alcohol here with this aldehyde, we get a six-membered ring or six-membered hemiacetal or a cyclic hemiacetal and that's known as alpha-D-glucopyranose pyranose. So that's alpha-D-glucopyranose that comes from D-glucose. So whenever you mix glucose in water, aqueous solution, this is what is actually formed. The cyclic hemiacetal. So that's a practical example of hemiacetal formation. Here's another example. This is again a monosaccharide, a sugar. It's um, ribose. So we have here the um, ribose molecule. So the hemi the cyclic or the intramolecular 
hemiacetal formation gives this. In this case, notice this is a five-membered ring. So you can imagine here how this occurs because there are so many alcohols on the ring, uh, on the chain of the glucose, we can form different ring size. But the five-membered and six-membered ring size are most commonly found in nature. Let us turn our attention to the addition of another mole of alcohol to a hemiacetal. And now what's formed is the acetal. So let's go into this a little more. So let's look at this reaction, for example. This is a hemiacetal, and you recognize that because here is the carbon, here's the OR, and here's the OH. So that's a hemiacetal, and that comes from cyclohexanone. So just to refresh your memory, if you have here, cyclohexanone and you react this with um, CH3, CH2, OH, you will get this molecule, the hemiacetal. The hemiacetal, if there's another mole of ethanol, as shown here, this oxygen here, as a pair of unshared pair of electrons, will react with this carbon right here, because that's very that's partially positive because it's bonded to two electronegative oxygen atoms. And in the process, this OH will bond here to give water coming out. So what's happened here is eventually we'll have this OR that's bonded to this carbon and this leaves as water. So this is a acetal. Main difference here is that this carbon, which was the carbonyl carbon, now has two alkyl groups or two OR groups. I, sh that should, I should say two OR groups, not alkyl groups. Two OR groups bonded to it. So this carbon has one OR group from the alcohol and another OR group from the same alcohol. This type molecule is called a acetal. Let's look at some examples. So here is a hemiacetal from an aldehyde, react, reacting it with another mole of ethanol, we get our acetal. And here's the acetal. Carbon from the, carb, from the aldehyde, OR group, one, and another OR group here, two. And of course, this OH comes off as water. Another example, this is from the cyclohexanone. So this is the hemiacetal from cyclohexanone, which was made from a mole of alcohol reacting with cyclohexanone to form this molecule. If we take the hemiacetal here and react it with another mole of ethanol, we get the acetal. And we know it's an acetal because here's a carbon, one mole of OR and another mole of OR, two ORs that's here. Um, here's a concept you learned in general chemistry, Le Chatelier's principle. And that is if you have an equilibrium as shown here by this double arrow, so that means that all this and this and this and this exist in equilibrium. So in other words, if you have a beaker, you will have all four molecules 
in that beaker. But if you wanted to get this as the product, you can shift the equilibrium by taking this out. So if you evaporate off the water, the equilibrium will shift to give you a lot of acetal from the reactants here. So that's just a practical aspect of Le Chatelier's principle and the formation of acetal. Let us look at some examples here. So here is butanone, ketone, reacting with alcohol, one mole, that's the first mole. So we have the hemiacetal, because it's just one OR here. If you take another mole of the alcohol as shown here, this OH comes off as water, and now we have two ORs bonded, and that's the acetal. Same here, another example. Carbonyl is the ketone. In this case, we have methanol. So you should be able to recognize the alcohol that's used and the acetal that's formed. So in this case, we have two moles. Notice two moles. In the presence of an acid catalyst, these two moles will add to this carbon right here. So here's one, and here's two, and that makes this an acetal. An acetal. One thing I want to emphasize again, that it's an equilibrium. So we can drive the equilibrium to the right by removing water or we can drive the equilibrium to the left by adding a lot of water. So if we add water here, remember Le Chatelier's principle, if you add water here in the product, it will drive the reaction towards the reactant or to the left. If you remove water here, it will drive the equilibrium to the right because of Le Chatelier's principle. I'm emphasizing that because here is a practical application of that concept. So let us say that your first day on the job as an organic chemist is to carry out this transformation. So your boss said, we have lots of this molecule here but we actually need this molecule for a specific reason. Let's see what is the difference. The difference is that this molecule has here an alkene functionality and it's also an aldehyde. Over here, the alkene has been reduced, but the aldehyde has not been reduced. So how do you do that? If you went in the lab and you said, gee, I have lots of hydrogen and I have my catalyst, let me just do the reduction using this as my reducing agent. The problem is that it will reduce the alkene. By the way, this should be an alkene. It will reduce this alkene to the saturated compound and also it will reduce the carbonyl. So once again, I'll make this correction on the PowerPoints when I post it. But this is an alkene. If you carry the reduction with hydrogen of a catalyst, it will reduce both functionalities as shown here. So that's a problem because this is not what you want. What you want is really this. You just need to reduce that functionality and not this. So let's see how we can get around that. We can get around that by making an acetal of the aldehyde. We call that a protection. So we protect this group so it does not react. 
So we react this molecule here with two moles of methanol, as we had shown before, to get here the acetal. So here's the acetal, and we still have the alkene because this does not react with the alkene, just the aldehyde. Now we can carry out our reduction here to give our saturated molecule. It, this reaction here will not affect the acetal, so it's maintained here. In the last step, we can use lots of water so we can drive the equilibrium to regenerate the aldehyde. So this is the product that we're trying to get. So once again, just for emphasis, this reaction here is the acetyl formation. Two moles of alcohol will react with the aldehyde to form the acetyl. It will not react with the alkene. Once you have made this molecule here, it can now react by reduction using H2 and Pt to reduce this group to saturated. Notice these are just hydrogens here. Once you have this acetal here, we just need to convert this acetal back to our aldehyde. We can do that by adding lots of water to the acetal to regenerate our aldehyde. And of course, two moles of our alcohol, methanol in this case. So that's the end of chapter 17, the reactions of aldehydes and ketones. So it's a lot in this chapter. So take your time to read it through. Get your scratch paper as you read through, write through these reactions. Make sure you're familiar with writing the structures of the reactants and the products. And of course, the reagents that are used, such as sodium dichromate for the oxidizing agent and sodium borohydride for the reducing agent or hydrogen over platinum. So make sure you can do that. You may want to pause the video at different points so you can really absorb those concepts and be able to apply them. And of course, as we always conclude by saying that we're not just here to learn the facts of organic chemistry, the concepts of organic chemistry, but equally important to be able to apply those concepts to solving problems so we can train our minds to be good problem solvers. So continue to study hard. I'll post more information on D2L. Okay?